All right. Here we go. Season four. Starting now. First clap on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this very exciting episode of True Crime and Cocktails, season four premiering right now as you're listening. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash, and as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How you feeling? Oh, I'm jazzed. What Listen, else could you be heading into season four? Now, I've been trying to think of a catchy catchphrase. A catchy catchphrase. Out of the gate. I like it. And as if you if you're an OG listener of this show, then you know that the way my brain works is anytime I hear any word in conversation, I, it triggers a song lyric in my mind always. Yes. And the thing that keeps coming to mind anytime I think true crime and cocktails season four, then I just hear more, more, more. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, Billy Idol, I believe. Billy Idol. So uh, season four, more, more, more. Here we are. (laughs) Look, I think you're coming in hot with the right energy for a new season. Yeah. Why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, listen, we've had a couple weeks off, but the truth is is that we don't have weeks off. People, you know, (laughs) they've they've been very kind to say, like, hope you're enjoying your break. And it's like, well, you know, we we don't really get a real break. But that's, you know, this is a this is what it's like when you're uh, business women. That's nice. Oh, I like employed, you know. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds less (laughs) fun than business women. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was like, like we, we, we tell all the time that we're, we're a week ahead of when the show comes out because we need to be, to be able to get it up and have it edited, whatnot. Uh, So we always record like a week ahead, sometimes a little less if things come up, but uh, so researching has to happen the week before that. So it's always like, it's, it's just a whole thing, but (laughs) Anytime we take one week off, we get so many like, hope you're having a, hope you're relaxing, whatever. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm working. I'm doing next week's thing. It just means I didn't have to record this week. Yes. So yeah. And then it saved us three hours essentially. But this time, this time it was like, oh, but we have like two weeks off. So technically I don't have to start researching until next week. So I have that week off. So I'm like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna stranger things. I did uh, spend a large chunk of that week uh, rewatching the first three and a half seasons of stranger things before the, the fi- the drop of the second part of season four. Yeah. But I was like, here we go. Finally, like, this is like the first chunk of time off I've had since December. So I can't wait. Next chunk of time in the future, it's looking like December. So yeah. I'm like, this, this is it. This is it. I can't wait. What am I going to do? Um, the answer is in like the span of three days, work like mad to pull together a garage sale. <laughs> which which went, went well, but wow. Yeah. And then... Uh, we had recorded, we, uh, the world, the world has met them already. So I can say it. Um, the last thing we recorded was some Bert and Larry, the bird brothers. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at you. Yeah. I'm wearing the merch for those people listening. Not uh, watching. I'm not wearing it. Cause I don't have any yet. I have not. It's on the way. It's nope, on the way I to just, you. I just, these are not things I ever think, uh, to deal with. Uh, but we finished recording that and I went, whew, you know what? I just don't think I feel well. It's fine. It's nothing. And then I really bust my ass physically <laughs> to get this whole sale done because I'm very specific about how I like things organized. The amount of people that came to that sale and went, this is so nice, like so nicely organized. And I was like, this is why I do it. <laughs> this is why I do what I do. <laughs> it, it's lovely. But then the sale ended like where we were sitting like an hour was left and I was like I don't I don't know if I can make it like I I feel worse 
than I did earlier because I've been pushing myself nonstop. And so I was like, I, I don't know. Um, it ended. I went in the house and stayed in bed for 24 hours <laughs> and then um, tested myself uh, a few times. No COVID. It just turns out a massive sinus infection that knocked me on my ass so bad. Uh, I was then, I got up, uh, tried to have food and then went back to bed uh, and only got up uh, for a, a Patreon live that we did and then went right back to bed. <laughs> and so that's how I binged so much Stranger Things because I was in bed so horribly sick. And then I kind of started feeling better. And I was like, here we go. Here we go. I'm, I'm out of it. I've only got a few days and then I've got to start researching, but I'm feeling better now. I'm ready. And then my teenager comes to me and goes, hey, you know what I've been thinking? I hate the color on my walls. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's funny. You picked the color when we moved into this house. And I came every night for hours for a week to paint everybody's bedrooms the color they wanted. How come you don't like it now? It was a, the brightest blue you can imagine. And he's like, it's just not very mature. And I'm like, oh, here we sure. go. It's God. not mature enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so he went to a store. He got the little paint swatches. He asked me my opinions. He decided on one. And then the next day I went, what was that one you wanted again? And he picked another one. So I'm like, you're not ready. You're not ready. Uh, and then I'd be like, oh, and what one now? Another one. So I'm like, no, you're not ready. So he picked one. And I said, I have a very small window of time before I have to go back to work. So I can help you in that very small chunk of time because I don't want to have to stop researching to go paint and then go back. Like, no, no thanks. No, I'm going to waste the last few days of my days off painting. So I'm like, it's fine. He's never painted before. I'm let's go. Let's do this. <laughs> what we didn't anticipate was his part-time job realizing, oh, hey, it's summer. He doesn't have school and scheduling him for nine hour shifts that whole weekend I was off. So in the end, uh, he helped me the first day and then he had to work. So then I just paid. <laughs> so I got to spend the rest of my time uh, painting and that's nice. So uh, if this was a September back in school doing an essay of how did I spend my summer vacation, uh, the answer is physical labor. I don't like illness. this for you. <laughs> she was going back and forth about the, the, the garage sale. And I was like, I was, yeah. what do I need to do to ask you not to do this? I was like, it's going to be so much work. Is yeah. there anything? And then she's like, but I love it. And I was like, okay. I okay. like, I like the organization of it all. I don't like, you know, hauling everything out there. I don't like sitting and actually dealing with the sale and having someone come up to me and throw a bunch of things down and go, I'll give you five bucks. Cause then I'm like, I, I need to do some really quick math and I'm not quick with math. Um, and it's just like, there's a lot of things I don't like about it, but I like, I like the organization. I like, you know, putting certain toys together in a bag to make it look nice and the pricing. And like, I, I like that part. I like laying it out in categories which someone pointed out to me, someone jokingly, someone I know, bless her heart, uh, said she saw me uh, hanging up signs. Uh, so that's how she learned where I lived. Uh, so she stalked me to my own home. That's my own fault being out there putting my signs up. Mm -hmm. uh, but she said it very jokingly. I was like, yeah, very funny. Uh, and she's like, this is very nicely organized. And I was like, thanks. And she made the joke. Is it alphabetized too? And I was like, <laughs> no. And then we looked at it. It fucking was. Because it was like, oh, we have books. And, and then DVDs. And then games that go into toys. Oh, no, sorry. The games went into the housewares that went into the toys. So I'm like, this is a problem. <laughs> It's a problem. It's what a problem. I like is that you're alphabetizing when you don't even know you're doing it. 
it's yeah 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 and look the lists that i had to write to do this sale (laughs) 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 Uh, she likes a list she loves a list (laughs) the point is that part was fun yes and then it was just all the rest of it and then feeling unwell and being like oh i'm i'm headed in a bad way and then being like i was just sick it's Stop there's it. no justice Stop there's it. no justice but i'm out of it now so well listen you know? I, I thank goodness for that and yeah. i have to say you know uh i guess you're right i guess we did we were able to kind of like you know cuz again the the work that i do day to day on the podcast is different unless i'm researching that week but like i'm back end work the, the merch store the the numbers the the you know the nuts and bolts, the, the, I'll say it, 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 the boring stuff. Um, I like doing it, so it's fine, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not jazzy. Sure. It's, it's not snazzy. Um, but I timed it out so that I could take a couple of last minute trips. Hey, so that's how I spent my summer vacation is I took, yeah. I took a, a two nighter to Scottsdale, Arizona. Hey. Um, and, uh, I'm just going to have to be name droppy uh, because it's also uh, amazing. It was uh, to, to see uh, some people I got connected to during the pandemic and they're from my favorite reality show. And that reality show is 90 Day Fiance. And it was David and Annie, sure. the king and queen of the franchise. Sure. They're just, uh, you know, lovely humans. They they were like, do you want to come and party? And I said, I do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, so a friend of the podcast, uh, Inessa, who I've mentioned on the show before, she uh, she hopped a plane with me. We went there for two nights. Uh, we also met up with Caleb from the most recent season of Before the Ninety Days. It was a ninety day. It was a it was a ninety day fiance hot stew. Hot hey, stew. Um, and then it got back, and then I was like, uh, I was supposed to take a trip to New Orleans back in April. I don't know if people remember this, if you were listening then, but I got caught in Portland when I was shooting up in Portland. Right. And I couldn't go to New Orleans. I got snowed in and they were like, we we haven't had snow in Portland in 35 years. And I'm like, of course you would have it the one day that I would need to fly out. Okay. No problem. Um, so anyway, so I didn't get to take that trip then. Uh, and so my friend, friend of the podcast, uh, Stephanie Beatrice is, is, uh, is in New Orleans right now. And so I went down there and, uh, that was uh, a hoot and a half. It was hey. New Orleans. It was over uh, the 4th of July. And whether you're celebrating or you're not, if you're in New Orleans, you're celebrating. It doesn't sure. matter what day of the year it is, what day of the week it is. Um, just a, again, a hoot. It was almost a hoot nanny. Um, hey, oh, I like was, that. There was times on both of those trips that I, I put into play a very old adage that is in my uh, vocabulary from when I used to do a show called Scare Tactics where we prank people by scaring them. And there was one day, and this rarely happened, but there was one day we, it, we, we scared her too much. And it was because it was a psychological scare. It was, it was a psychological oh. scare and it went too far. And after it was done, one of the producers came up to me and he said, sometimes you got to cross the line to know where the line is. And that's not an expression I would use in general in life, unless it's in something like, you know, partying. And all I'll say is, is that in both of those cities, I crossed that line and I found out where that line was. And boy, oh, boy, oh, I was also sick, but not for the same reasons as you. Um, Yeah, it was. We just, you know, again, it was a uh, it was such a, such a great time. And it was nice to, you know, I I've talked about this on the show before. I think it's important to get your yayas out. I think in general in life, yes. you got to you got to go. You got to you got to eat. You got to drink. You got to make merry with with people that uh, you love. And uh, it's uh, it's such a fun thing. And then last final name drop. But again, these are people in my life. Uh, my my dear friend Bobby Burke was uh, on Queer Eye. They're shooting down in New Orleans right now. So hey. then they found out uh, that we were there, and we had this giant, basically Queer Eye for this, or it's not Queer Eye for the straight, straight guy anymore. The, the show is just called Queer Eye now, obviously. Um, but the, the pool party on July Fourth just turned into a the cast and crew of that show and and us, and, sure. uh, and then it, it did turn into like uh, just me being like, I feel fine. Uh, yeah, I've been drinking margaritas all day. No problem. And then it's like, I walked up to my room. And by the time I got up to my room in the hotel, I was like, I'm not okay. <laughs> I've been having margaritas all day. Um, so yeah, but listen again, uh, but we, we, we got all of our work done. I got everything done that I needed to do. 
you know, and uh, who gets hurt other than my liver? I think that according to Gray's Anatomy, I think you can have part of mine, can't you? I think that I want, you know what? (laughs) This is what I was about to say. We should really get our blood tests done to see if we can be donors. I don't know if that's a thing. Is it just a blood test? I think it depends on the organ you need. (laughs) Oh, doctors are going to hate me for this. Like, as long as it's, yeah, as long as your like blood's the same, isn't it all okay? (laughs) No, no, I, I think you're think right. So. I think it I think is. You have to be tested depending on the organ. What's your blood type? Do you know? I do. Fun story. I don't know. Mm-hmm. In mm-hmm. high school, <laughs> <laughs> in biology class, we did a thing where we were learning about blood types. And one chunk of an assignment, we had to do something with our blood type, but none of us know our blood type. So the first part of the assignment was everybody gets a little needle and a little cotton swab. And we were all supposed to prick our finger and bleed on something and then like look under a microscope or do whatever to figure out what our blood type was. Um, I, a chicken, uh, could not go through with it. And so I had someone, a real bleeder, (laughs) Just a little extra blood on my paper under the microscope. Uh, So that day, I believe um, I was like an AB or something. I don't know. But the point is, I never found out because I was too scared. Well, I guess I'm going to have to get some more definitive proof before (laughs) I start swapping (laughs) livers with you. (laughs) Yeah, there has to be a way we can get livers tested, isn't there? Or just like, yeah, we should look into this. One of us might need a kidney one day. You never know. Well, we know we'll be the first stop. Of course. Of course. But yeah, maybe we should prepare. I don't know. It's something to think about. Well, speaking of speaking of livers, what you drinking over there? (laughs) Well, funny you should mention it. Uh, We got onto this Zoom and I I, I just had a basic folk. I was going to go get a Slurpee and I ran out of time and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do a basic folk. And then we got chatting about things because we haven't had a Zoom conversation in a few weeks now. Yeah. Uh, so that drink was done before we started. Yeah. So then we had a quick pee break and a quick refresh of drink and then come back. So I've come back with uh, a Smirnoff Ice Berry Blast. Yes. Uh, apparently it's like a it's like a rocket, you know, like the rocket uh, popsicle. Oh, like the three colored ones. Yeah, it's a citrus, blue, raspberry, cherry. And how do you feel about it? I don't mind it. I think think if I have two more, I'm going to love it. That's true of me with most drinks. You know, like the first one, I'm like, okay. Because I went in, I had the problem. It would have been better if I hadn't have done a pop before that. Because I went into it with the, the sweet And then I'm having one that's a little less sweet than that. So it's, if I'd started with this, I would have been like, oh, out of the park. But because I didn't, yeah, I uh, screwed myself. But we'll see what happens as the night goes on. I have season four to myself. And I didn't even know it until right in this second, which is I have four drinks on the go. Oh, Typically on this show, I have three. I have four. I've got a regular water. Yeah. Wonderful. I've got a lime ginger water sparkling. Hey, I've got a watermelon high noon because again, yes, we logged on early and that's almost done. And then I'm about to crack into a mango high noon because meow, meow, it is season four all the time. Um, And I I was trying to come up with a rhyme and I don't know why I'm trying to fight it so hard. Were you three drinks before season three? Oh my God. We're going to have to go back and check. We can't. This is what I've been doing. (laughs) Season five might kill me then. This might New Orleans me every week. Um, Wow. Good question. Well, well, exactly. Um, Now, listen, before we get into the episode, which I'm very excited about, uh, I do see here there's a little note on my paper Leah Michelle. We have been getting tagged a lot. Yes. In the Leah Michelle news. Obviously, the Glee curse, if you haven't listened to it yet, go back in our back catalog. It's a romp. 
an award-winning romp of an episode of the show. It is. Um, so I actually don't know a lot about what's going on right now. I know that she's taking over for Beanie Feldstein and or Feldstein, excuse me, uh, yeah. in Funny Girl on Broadway, and that there's something, there's some energy uh happening what what else do you do you know anything else uh i don't know a lot i know that uh i can't remember her name but one of the actors from glee who i mentioned back in the glee curse but again yes that's right that was long enough ago i don't remember um she had said back in the day that leah michelle may have been racist towards her she's now coming out again and was like hey remember that time let's not just you know, sweep that under the rug, uh, which is great. But I just feel like there the the line between Leah Michelle and Rachel Berry has blurred so much at this point. Yeah. Like what are the odds that because wasn't Rachel Berry's whole thing? Like she wanted funny girl. Like I think she even did a song I from it on the so. show. And that feels like, listen, I know that some people have asked, is there going to be a follow-up Glee Curse episode? I'm not saying yes or no right now, because this is the first I've ever brought it up to Christy, and I'm not committing us to anything. (laughs) But isn't it a little interesting that when we were talking in that episode, my main theory was that Ryan Murphy had made a deal with some sort of devil, demon, spirit, whatever, and that the reason why there's so much, you know, tragedy that has befallen people from glee is because he made this deal and of course the show was wildly successful and then of course but the but the trade-off right right it does seem interesting that if that is the case it's like did she make a deal did he did he say this is how i made my deal did she do something and now this is coming true for her but then we're, we're obviously something bad is gonna come i mean look if if they're comes out to be enough info we'd have to do a of course glee part two um but like it's just this is gonna sound rude i encourage it i'm just always shocked she keeps getting work (laughs) (laughs) like rachel barry it's like yeah that that's who that is and i've just only seen her as that since then i've never and really what else have i seen her in i guess well i don't know well listen if i'm hearing anything it's that i we've we've heard you dear listeners yeah we're gonna look into this true crime and cocktails is gonna be you know are we're gonna keep abreast of this case uh as it unfolds because i have a feeling thank you thank you very much i have a feeling this is just the beginning though if if this is going to go the way of the rest of the stories about the Glee curse, this is just the beginning of where this is going to go. It also feels sure. like um, I'm curious to see what happens as as the the kind of um, you know the conversation and discourse be- continues about perhaps her behavior in the past, maybe her behavior more recently. Sure, you know, typically people who have acted that way in the past don't tend to just give it up. Usually, there's where there's smoke, there's fire. So, sure. Um, stay tuned. We'll be talking about this more in the future. I am sure. Plus, but getting who into knows this episode, what's yeah. going to happen with that Matthew Morris and stuff? Didn't remember it came just... out and then yep. it just under the rug. I know he came out, made a statement, and then it immediately quieted. And I also just want to say, and I love that I'm not drunk enough and we're not deep in the episode enough for me to be, <laughs> for me to be running my mouth yet. But guess what? Season four, more, more, more. Um, I love it already. When he came out and he read his alleged Instagram DM to this gal. Yes. It said something along the lines of, hey, what's your number? I want to get you in touch with somebody or something. Okay. And he's like, what's the problem with that? I'm going to tell you exactly what the problem is with that. If I received that message from somebody who was in a position of power at my workplace where I was competing on a show and he was a judge, because that was the dynamic, correct? Right. Yes. There is absolutely no reason why you cannot communicate with me using Instagram DM. You've just done it. You don't need my personal phone number. You don't need my email. If you want to get me in touch with someone, you can give me the information. Hey. This is what I was thinking. 
this is this person that I know. I think he would be great, whatever. If you are interested, let me know and we can talk further. Yeah. Here's another idea. You work in the same place. Why weren't you having a face-to-face conversation with this person about it? I, uh, to me, his like using that as a defense that he did nothing wrong. I was like, I personally think it's, uh, yeah. Did he, did he use foul language or say something overtly sexual? No, he's right. He didn't do either of those things. But to me, it was like, it was, it would make me feel uncomfortable too, because there was absolutely no reason why you couldn't just communicate using the, the form of communication that you just used. Yeah. Why do you need her number without telling her why or getting into a conversation? Maybe she's not interested in you connecting her to whoever this other person is. You need to you need yeah. to inform the person of what your intention is. And also, did she ask you? Because unless you'd brought this up or had a conversation of about it before, I'm also tired of the like, I can help you out. Because what are what are the implications there? He can claim that they're completely innocent, but there is absolutely an energy there when a sure. much older more successful man in a position of power is saying that to a younger woman, there is an energy there, whether we like it or not. There are ways that you can handle it if you are being 100% altruistic. That's why people have agents and managers so that you can go through them. So then that way, everything is above board. There are ways that things can be handled so that it doesn't feel that way because there's intrinsically an energy to that dynamic. Yeah. All I'm saying. Yeah, that makes sense. But to your point, we got two. We got yeah. a Leah Michelle update. We got a Matthew Morrison update. All we need is one more. And then I feel like we're dusting off for Glee Curse <laughs> 2. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I just, it's its how quickly his, his thing came out roaring and then silence. So well, I can't it's... wait till her NDA runs out or whatever and she can publicly speak about whatever happened and how he made it go away a hundred percent isn't it interesting how that always happens yeah yeah it sure is yeah it does um well listen it's a new season and that means i've got a notebook look a new notebook look at this come on how adorable uh all the season four art of the new uh art which we we're so jazzed about is available true crew merch.com um, there's even Larry and Bert bird merch. If you don't know what Larry and Bert bird are, you're like, what are you talking about? Go on to our Instagram, uh, true crime and cocktails, really any of our channels. And you can find uh, some commercials that we made playing some characters that really cracked us up. Uh, just so funny. Uh, so ridiculous. Um, I just couldn't be happier <laughs> about all of it. It was just, a, it was a romp. It was almost as much of a romp as the glee curse. I'll say it maybe even more. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, let's get into it then, shall we? This yeah. episode, we're talking about Selena. And I just have to say, honest to God, I think we have gotten more requests to cover Selena on the show. Wouldn't you say it, it, it's been like Jean Bonnet at the beginning, oh, Madeline yeah. McCann? Yeah. And I think Selena. Oh, there have been so many. So many. There's, so, yeah. You well, ask, we listen. You ask, we listen. Here we grow. In 1994, Mexican-American singer Selena was on top of the world. She was performing for record-breaking crowds in the United States, Mexico, and Central America. Some of her albums were certified platinum and earned her numerous awards, including a Grammy. Outside of the music world, Selena was a fashion icon who helped to design her own clothing line, which was sold at her very own boutiques. But just when Selena was poised to take the English language pop market by storm, she was tragically shot in March 1995. Her death stunned the Latin music community and her fans, especially when the killer turned out to be the biggest fan of all. Christy Oxborough investigates. (laughs) Shit, I forgot about that part. If I had thought of it, I would have put it in. So listen, no problem. Again, it's... It's been a little while since I've I'm your other these. kidney. Okay. That's the, that's a thing. If, some, yeah. if, if your yeah. body's not processing part of what you've been drinking, I'll do it for you. This makes sense. This makes sense. And what's going to make sense is we're, uh, between the two of us, we're going to end up with like one liver that we have to like sp- split amongst us. Yep. And then it's going to turn into like, we have to physically be attached to make and then this we work. will be happy as clams. Yeah, yeah, then it's like, 
so do we both just get in the car for the McDonald's or does somebody else bring it? Or like, that's just, it's mm-hmm. our life. Just get on the couch. Away you go. I love it. Oh boy. God, I love it. Uh, it's only been uh, a few weeks, but feels like the first time. You know what I mean? Yep. Ooh, maybe because I haven't boozed in a while and heaven help me. So as always, and by always, I mean the past at least season, yep. if not maybe two. Um, disclaimer off the top. Uh, this episode will contain mentions of suicide and rape. Trigger warning for those who need it. And with other uh, recent episodes of this show, I apologize in advance if my pronunciations are not 100%. I am genuinely trying, but English is my only language. <laughs> You're doing great. Lord knows, ask the, uh, the, the poor woman who tried to teach me French every morning before school in the seventh grade for that year. It was hell for us both. and then the 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 poor woman in the ninth grade because i still had to take french um who uh asked me to pronounce something and i mispronounced it and then she went it's this and i went whatever uh and she not whatever like she snapped at me in front of that class and i just like "Mm mm-hmm like i had no time for her she had no time for me. She had no time for that attitude, but I gave it anyway. It's because it was, it was another language. Yeah. Languages are hard. Oh, languages are I, hard. I, I spent years trying to devour French and I, I don't, I don't know a word of it, but I've learned looking at certain words in this, I try and pronounce them a French way. And that's not what you do for Spanish words because who are uh, very different, very different. Language. different. different yeah. Language. I've had to uh, really write things out phonetically for, for myself. And even then it's going to be, uh, it's going to be the best you got. I believe in you. So of course you do. Us and our uh, shared kidney. Yep. So Selena Quintanilla was born April 16th, 1971 in Lake Jackson, Texas. She was the third and youngest child to Abraham and Marcella, who had Abraham III, known as AB, in December 1963, and Suzette in June 1967. Throughout her third pregnancy, Marcella had been planning for a boy. So when they found out that they'd actually had a daughter, they didn't have a name picked out. The woman in the room next to Marcella had been preparing for a girl, but ended up having a boy. So the woman suggested Marcella could use the name that she had picked out uh, since she would no longer be using it. The name, of course, was Selena. Uh, As a former musician, Abraham saw immediate potential in Selena, who started singing at the age of three. Abraham said, quote, her timing, her pitch, were perfect. I could see it from day one. And because he saw potential in his daughter and possibly because his own musical career didn't go as far as he had hoped, Abraham decided to create a band with nine-year-old Selena as lead vocals, AB on the bass, and Suzette on the drums. The group which Abraham managed was called Selena y Los Dinos, which translates basically to like Selena and the guys. I should also mention, uh, because I didn't write it in here, because it didn't seem worthwhile, but can't stop me now. Um, In his musician days, when he was younger, Abraham was part of a group that was called Los Dinos. So, ah, okay. Not one to let that go. Uh, Abraham wanted the kids band to perform Tejano music, which is kind of like known as Tex-Mex music. It's a mix of Mexican folk music, polkas, and country, usually sung in Spanish. Tejano music was historically male-dominated, but Abraham was adamant that his children play the genre in order to honor their family's heritage. 
Selena was often told that as a woman, she would never be successful in the genre. The band was also often refused bookings in Texas because they performed Tejano music, although sometimes they were refused bookings due to the age of the band members or the fact that their lead singer was female. But Selena e uh, Los Dinos got their start performing at clubs, restaurants, fairs, quinceañeras, and weddings throughout Texas. But the thing is, Selena was raised with English as her first language. So to sing in the Tejano style, she had to be taught. So Selena sang phonetically based on what her father told her. She eventually became fluent in Spanish, but it took a very long time to get there. Uh, I just find it fascinating that a singer known for singing in Spanish did not speak the language at the time when she started singing. It just yeah. goes to show how incredibly talented she was. Totally. Uh, around the time that Abraham started the band, he quit his job as a shipping clerk at Dow Chemical and opened a Mexican restaurant called Papagayos. His children's band often performed there. But because of a recession, Abraham was forced to close the restaurant in 1981, causing the Quintanilla family to file for bankruptcy. The band then became the Quintanilla's main source of income. They moved to Corpus Christi, Texas, and Selena y Los Dinos began recording professionally. In 1984, they released their first album, oh boy, Miss Primeras Grabaciones, Grabaciones, I believe, uh, with a small independent company, Freddie Records. Freddie, I can use that. I can say that word. No problem. <laughs> Grabaciones. Nope. Well, it was close. Uh, don't tell me if it wasn't. Uh, Abraham refurbished an old bus into the band's tour transportation, and it was christened Big Bertha. Couldn't love people more for naming vehicles. I'm ashamed that mine uh, currently does not have a name. Uh, as the band's popularity grew, the intense tour schedule started to impede with Selena's schooling, so Abraham took Selena out of school in the eighth grade. Some of Selena's teachers were concerned about this decision and even threatened to report the Quintanillas to the Texas Board of Education. In 1989, Selena earned her high school diploma from Chicago's American School of Correspondence. She got accepted to Louisiana State University, but ended up taking business administration courses through correspondence at Pacific Western University. Selena graduated in 1994 with a business administration degree. While the band's popularity continued to rise, when Selena was just 15, she won Best Female Artist of the Year at the Tejano Music Awards in 1986. It would be one of the first of many consecutive award wins for Selena, but we will get into that later in our program. Thank you. Selena y Los Dinos released seven studio albums between 1984 and 1988, including Alpha in 1986, Muni Kita de Trapo in 1987, and Dolce Amor in 1988. After performing in the, at the 1989 Tejano Music Awards, Selena was offered a deal with Capitol Records. But Abraham chose to go with EMI Latin after they doubled Capitol's offer. EMI believed that Selena would be the next Gloria Estefan. Estefan. I mean, I guess it's been a long time since I've said her name out loud. Well, <laughs> it happens. It does. It does. Uh, Selena's first solo album, which was self-titled, was released October 17th, 1989. Her brother, A.B., was her main producer and songwriter. Also in 1989, Selena was approached to be the Coca-Cola spokesperson in Texas. She agreed and remained their spokesperson until her death, which again, we'll get into later. Mm -hmm. uh, the jingle used in her first two Coke commercials was written by A.B., and the band's new guitarist, Chris Perez. A.B. brought Chris into the band months prior to this. 
At the time when he first joined the band, Chris had a girlfriend living in San Antonio. So for the first year he was with the band, his relationship with Selena was strictly professional. But a year later, AB treated some of the band members to a vacation in Acapulco uh, as a thank you for helping with the Coca-Cola jingle. According to Chris, quote, our feelings for each other had begun to build after the trip to Mexico. Selena and Chris finally admitted their feelings for each other in a pizza hut, which is one of the most charming things I've ever heard and feels so pure. So cute. And what upsets me is the, uh, the 1997 JLo movie, Selena. Yeah. Which I will get into later. Um, recently gave that a rewatch for this. No pizza hut. I was very upset. I'm sure my husband's so tired of watching movies with me when I'm watching them for research sake, because I always just go, no, no. Okay. No. Well, do you want to hear what really happened? Like Inaccurate. I do it, yeah. I do it all the time. I'm sure it drives him crazy, but I am who I am. Yep. So they confess their feelings to each other, but they knew that Abraham was not going to approve. So they kept their relationship a secret. But then Suzette caught them together and she immediately went and told Abraham, who, as they predicted, wildly disapproved. Even though Selena's mother was fine with the relationship happening, Abraham was convinced that Chris would bring about Selena's downfall. Abraham later said, quote, I saw him as a threat. What if they got married and he pulled her out of the band? All the work we did all those years would go down the tubes. And of course, Abraham would be worried about Selena's career since it was tar- starting to take off. In September 1990, Selena's second solo album, Ven Conmigo, was released. It sold more than 500,000 copies, meaning that it achieved gold status, making it the first Tejano album by a female artist to do so. Wow. Yeah. So Abraham disapproves of the relationship and tells Chris, oh yeah, by the way, the relationship, it's done. But like many young couples in love, Chris and Selena continued to see each other in secret despite her father's objections. One night while on tour, Abraham caught Selena and Chris together. So he pulled the bus over and threatened to disband the group. He then called Chris a cancer in his family oh my and God. fired him. I just find it wild that Abraham was so against Selena being with Chris because he believed that Chris would make Selena give up music. And he thought threatening to disband the group was the move. Yeah. Great he'll, point. He'll make her give up music. Not before I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Abraham, if Chris made your daughter happy, let her have more than just a career. Huh? You know, Uh, but of course it wasn't enough to stop Chris and Selena. The couple once again continued to see each other in secret. Then they got the idea that maybe if they got married, then Selena's father would just have to accept them together. So on April 2nd, 1992, Chris and Selena secretly eloped. They were 22 and 20 respectively at the time. But as it happens with people in the public eye, their secret was soon found out and broadcast on the radio, which was not exactly the best way for Abraham to find out. Abraham took the news of the marriage badly, and from what I've read, ended up just walking away from his family for a while. Oh my God. I don't think he was gone very long, uh, because at one point he did come back. Uh, He apologized for overreacting he welcomed chris into the family welcomed him back into the band and maybe it's because he saw that chris continued to be supportive of selena's career or maybe it's because he saw selena's career taking off without him we'll never know Mm -hmm. uh chris and selena soon moved into a house next to uh her family now i wouldn't say i'm an overly spiteful person Aside from my anxieties, I am relatively chill, but I can respect a properly placed amount of spite. 
And I couldn't be happier to know that Abraham was so absolutely convinced that a relationship with Chris would destroy Selena's career. And yet, when her third studio album, Entre Mimundo, was released just one month after her wedding, it peaked at number one on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Albums chart, where it remained for eight consecutive months. Wow. In fact, the album was considered by critics to be Selena's breakthrough album and career launcher. The album included the single Como La, La Flor, uh, which would become one of Selena's signature songs, as well as the single Buenos Amigos, which peaked at number one on the Billboard Top Latin Songs chart, making it Selena's first number one single. Wow. It's also the fact that this happened so soon after the that they got married that it's like, hmm, I guess it wasn't so bad. I understand yeah. that it was very soon, but the marriage never hurt her is my point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let her live. I don't know what wow. that was. <laughs> I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. The problem is, again, I haven't had booze in a while. So everybody get great. ready. You're doing great. Get ready. I chose the one where I speak Spanish. That was wise. <clears throat> oh boy. Entre Mi Mundo sold more than 600,000 copies, making it the first Tejano album by a female artist to sell over 300,000. The album helped Selena to dominate the Latin music charts and it increased her popularity in Mexico. Two years later, the album was listed as the second best-selling regional Mexican album of all time. As of October 2017, that particular album is no longer in the top 10 on that list, but Selena's fourth album is listed as the fourth best-selling Mexican album of all time, and her fifth album is currently number one. Wow. Yeah, and that was a while ago. But again, we'll get into it. Mm -hmm. On February 7th, 1993, Selena performed a free concert at Memorial Coliseum in Corpus Christi. Her performance was recorded and released in May of that year with the title Selena Live. The album reached number two on Billboard's top Latin albums chart and became certified gold for selling more than 500,000 copies. Selena Live won Album of the Year at both the Billboard Latin Music Awards and the Tejano Music Awards. It also won a Grammy for Best Mexican American Album, making Selena the first female Tejano artist to ever win a Grammy. Wow. With a broadening audience, Selena started to expand her tour to include Mexico, such as the Festival Acapulco in May 1993, and a show in Nuevo León in September, which was attended by 70,000 people. Mexican media hailed Selena as an artist of the people. Selena released her fourth album, Amor Prohibido, uh, in March 1994, just two months before her historical Grammy win. It debuted at number three on the Billboard Top Latin Albums chart and number one on the U.S. Billboard Regional Mexican Albums chart. To this day, it is still one of the best-selling Latin albums in the United States, and Billboard magazine ranked the album as one of the top 100 albums of all time, as well as one of the most essential Latin recordings in the past 50 years. Critics say the album was responsible for pushing Tejano music into the mainstream, making it become one of the most popular Latin genres at the time. The album also helped to popularize Tejano music among a wider and more younger audience. It became the first Tejano album to find commercial success in Puerto Rico. Oh. It won Album of the Year at the Tejano Music Awards and was nominated for Best Mexican American Album at the Grammys. The album spawned four number one singles, including my personal favorite, and I apologize because I do not have her swagger to be able to say this properly, bitty bitty bum bum. It's if you've ever heard her perform that, let me tell you, you're gonna move. Oh yeah, come absolutely. On. Come on. With the release of Amor Prohibido, Selena was dubbed the Queen of Tejano music. 
She toured the United States, Central America, Argentina, and the Dominican Republic. Selena also tried her hand at acting, appearing in two different telenovelas, including one called Dos, Dos, sorry, Dos Mujeres Un Camino, which starred Eric Estrada. Hello. Yeah. Selena also had a cameo in the 1994 Johnny Depp film Don Juan DeMarco. Hey. Yeah. In late 1994, the chairman of EMI Latin felt that Selena was ready to cross over into the English language pop market. So Selena started work on an English album, something she had been wanting to do since the start of her career. While making the album, Selena performed to a sold-out crowd at the Houston Astrodome on February 26, 1995. The crowd included 66,994 people, which broke the record that Selena had set a year prior. Wow. And since she's out there breaking records and proving that there was nothing she couldn't do, Selena decided to take the fashion world by storm. She was a fashion icon known for her colorful and bedazzled stage outfits, so much so she was dubbed the Mexican Madonna. Wow. Yeah. So when Selena was approached with the idea of creating her own fashion line, she jumped at the chance. She designed her stage outfits herself, complete with jumpsuits, rhinestone belts, fringe jackets, flared pants, and bedazzled bralettes. Let me tell you, the, the 90s were a beautiful time. Oh, there's a, re- there's a reason we're, it. we're all so nostalgic for it. Yep, yep. So Selena worked with fashion designer Martin Gomez to design the Selena clothing line. In 1994, she opened Selena Etc., Uh, with one location in Corpus Christi and another in San Antonio. Each boutique was equipped with an in-house beauty salon. Oh, cute. Selena held a fashion show to give people a preview of some of the items. And when the boutiques opened, they were a hit. They were doing so well, in fact, that Selena was in negotiations to open stores in Puerto Rico and one in Monterrey, Mexico. But when Selena was touring a lot, she didn't have much time to oversee the boutiques, so Abraham decided they needed to find someone else to put in charge while Selena was away. And he chose Yolanda Saldivar for the job. Who is Yolanda Saldivar? I'm so glad you asked. Yolanda was born September 19th, 1960 in San Antonio, Texas. She was the youngest of eight children, She was often teased as a child for her weight and ended up spending most of her time fairly isolated. And to anyone who may say, it's just teasing, kids will be kids. Let me say, bullying is bullying. It does incredible harm to the mental health of the victim. And if the bully is left unchecked, they remain a bully for life. I think we know a lot of adult bullies now. And I'm just going to say nothing is worse to me than an adult bully. Yep. So Yolanda graduated from high school in 1979. In 1985, she was accepted to the University of Texas before transferring to Palo Alto College and then Texas A&M. Yolanda graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in late 1990 and got her license as a registered nurse from the Texas Board of Nurse Examiners. Around this time, Yolanda got sued by a past employer, dermatologist Dr. Faustino Gomez claimed that Yolanda stole $9,200 from him during her employment, which started in 1983. Yolanda and the doctors settled the case out of court. But then two months later, Yolanda was back in court because she failed to repay her Texas student loan, which was just over $7,000, which in 2022, that's like $16,000. During her legal troubles, Yolanda went from working in a doctor's office, helping with scheduling and bookkeeping, to working as a nurse at St. Luke's Lutheran Hospital. She worked mostly mostly with patients with respiratory diseases and terminal cancer. Yolanda was mostly a fan of country music, but she also liked Tejano artist Shelly Lerez. In fact, Yolanda was such a big fan of Shelly's that she outright disliked Selena because Selena was winning the awards that Shelley had also been nominated for. 
Yolanda approached Shelley's father, Fred, asking for permission to start a fan club of Shelley's. But Fred said no, because only family members were allowed to work for Shelley. Fun fact, Shelley and Selena were only about seven months apart in age, and they were actually very close friends, despite the fact that they were considered to be musical competitors. Another fun fact, before jo joining Selena y Los Dinos, Chris Perez played with Shelley's band. Hey. Yeah, small, small world. world. <laughs> So in 1991, Yolanda's niece convinces Yolanda to attend a Selena concert with her. Yolanda was immediately mesmerized by Selena's dazzling stage presence. The next day, Yolanda went looking for Selena souvenirs, but came up empty handed. So she called Abraham Quintanilla to get his blessing to start a fan club. Yolanda claims she only called Abraham three times but allegedly it was closer to 15. Oh boy. She even followed the band around as they toured for weeks, trying to get Abraham to say yes. And Abraham agreed a fan club could bring more exposure to the band and take Selena to new levels. So he gave Yolanda the green light. And in June, 1991, Yolanda officially became the president of Selena's fan club in San Antonio. Members would mail in $22, and in return, they'd receive promotional Selena items, such as a Selena t-shirt, posters, CDs, as well as get notifications of upcoming concerts and exclusive interviews with the band. In December, 1991, Yolanda got to officially meet Selena. And despite the 11 year age difference, the two women immediately clicked and became best friends. Selena said that Yolanda was like a sister to her. Meanwhile, Yolanda called Selena Miha, which is basically like saying my daughter. In early 1992, Yolanda left her job as a nurse to become Selena's personal assistant, despite the fact that it meant making less money. While taking on the new job, Yolanda was also working the merch table at Selena's shows and running the fan club. By 1993, the club had, had over 1,500 members and grew to over 8,000 by 1994. Yolanda very quickly became a highly trusted member of the Quintanilla's close-knit group. She had keys to Selena's house and access to banking information related to the band. Yolanda was also in charge of hiring people and doing anything that Selena needed. And she was even the one who encouraged Selena to pursue her passion of starting a clothing line. Selena sent Yolanda to Mexico to oversee the production uh, of the fashion line while Selena was touring. And as I mentioned earlier, once the boutiques opened, Yolanda was made manager because Abraham felt after managing the fan club successfully for three years, Yolanda had proved herself and was ready for a bigger role. The new title meant that Yolanda had access to bank accounts associated with the fan club and now to the accounts associated with the boutiques. She was also able to write and cash checks relating to the business and was given Selena's personal American Express card to use for business. However, Yolanda chose to use the card to buy not one, but two cell phones, uh, as well as to rent Lincoln Town cars whenever she needed to go anywhere. Oh, and also to take people to dinners at like really upscale restaurants. And we know Yolanda had financial issues with a past employer in the mid 1980s. So we shouldn't be surprised that she started to take advantage of Selena and the Quintanillas. But Yolanda seemed to want nothing but to help Selena succeed. So they all just automatically trusted her. Abraham later said he was suspicious of Yolanda immediately but if that was true, then why was he the one to suggest her to manage the boutiques? And let me be very clear. I am not blaming the Quintanilla family for trusting Yolanda. They had no reason not to trust her. I blame Yolanda for being a conniving snake because that's. <laughs> <laughs> of course, because that's course. where I'm at. That's where I'm at. So at this point, Selena's family started to accuse Yolanda of using her influence to control Selena. Things got so bad that if someone wanted to speak with Selena, 
they had to go through Yolanda first, even Selena's own family. In short, Yolanda was gatekeeping and getting possessive. Mm. And soon numerous people had complaints about Yolanda. Some of the staff at the Selena boutiques started to complain. They told Selena Yolanda treated them terribly whenever Selena wasn't around. But Selena always defended Yolanda, saying Yolanda would never intentionally hurt her or her business. The employees worried about Yolanda's hold over Selena, so they took their concerns to Abraham. But when he brought up the subject to Selena, she was adamant that Yolanda wasn't trying to harm her in any way. But it wasn't just the employees who seemed to have negative interactions with Yolanda. Martin Gomez, the designer who was working with Selena on the clothing line, outright quit because he found Yolanda to be, quote, off-putting. Martin even claimed that someone sabotaged some of his original pieces that he had been working on. When he returned from a business trip, he came back to find the hems had all been ripped out. Since Yolanda had access to his office, Martin assumed that she was the culprit. Martin also claimed that Yolanda refused to pay him for his work, and Martin and Yolanda would both just complain about each other to Selena, uh, who got to the point where she just said, I'll just design the clothes on my own. Again, at this point, she's like a 22, 23 year old girl. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the stress that this is putting on her. Yep. Uh, In January, 1995, Selena's cousin, Deborah Ramirez was hired at one of the stores to help with the hopeful expansion into Mexico. Less than a week later, Deborah quit because she couldn't handle Yolanda. Deborah noticed that receipts were missing. And when she would ask Yolanda about it, Yolanda just told her to mind her business. But the boutiques, which had initially been successful, seemed to take a turn. Between the two stores, the number of employees dropped from 38 down to 14, because Yolanda often just fired anyone she didn't like. And not only that, but the company suddenly didn't have enough money in its bank accounts to pay its bills. Abraham started looking through the financials and noticed that not only were a lot of documents missing, but there seemed to be a lot of unpaid overdue bills. Then he started to receive angry phone calls and letters from members of Selena's fan club. Dozens of people said they sent in money, but received nothing in return. It turns out Yolanda opened the fan club bank account under her sister's name and had been forging her sister's signature and pocketing the fan club money. Financial documents for the fan club also went missing, although they did find a letter that claimed the fan club bank account was going to be closed and an employee named Yvonne Perales would be depositing $3,000 into the bank. Mm -hmm. The thing is, Yvonne didn't, and that's likely because it seems as though Yvonne didn't exist. No one associated to the fan club or the family ever met Yvonne in person or spoke with her in any way, and the letter seemed to be written in Yolanda's handwriting. Not only had Yolanda allegedly been pocketing fan club money, she also had been writing forged checks from the boutique's account. It seemed that Yolanda had allegedly embezzled more than $60,000. Whoa! Abraham approached Selena with what he found, and while Selena usually defended Yolanda, this time Selena realized Yolanda was stealing from her. On March 9th, 1995, Abraham, Selena, and Suzette confronted Yolanda about the money. They later said Yolanda didn't deny the allegations and simply refused to turn over the financial documents that they needed to file taxes. <sighs> Abraham threatened to get the police involved, so Yolanda swore she'd hand over the papers. Abraham then banned Yolanda from interacting with Selena ever again. And when Yolanda showed up at Q Productions the next day, she was removed from the property by security. What is Q Productions' side note? Ooh. It is a record company and studio which specializes in Latin music. It was founded by Abraham Quintanilla in 1990 and is located on Leopard Street, in Corpus Christi, Texas. 
Do, 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 do. Right? I haven't mm-hmm. done a side note in a while. And I thought, it is time. I that was it. That was my best that. Rafiki in the moment. Oh, it was good. Thank you. Uh, that same day, Selena removed Yolanda's name from the ba- boutique's bank account. And Yolanda was replaced as fan com- club president by a woman named Irene Herrera. But Selena believed in her heart that Yolanda was vital to the Selena boutique expansion in Mexico. And because Yolanda had the documents that they needed, Selena kept putting off firing her. Yolanda called Selena and agreed to hand over the documents if Selena would agree to meet her at the Days Inn Motel in Corpus Christi on March 31st, 1995. Selena didn't tell anyone that she agreed to meet Yolanda. In room 158, just before noon, Selena again asked Yolanda for the papers that she needed. According to Yolanda, Selena lost her patience and emptied Yolanda's bag, which had papers and a Taurus model 85 snub-nosed 38 caliber revolver. Out of fear, Yolanda grabbed the gun, and when they started to argue, Yolanda claims the gun just accidentally went off. Selena got shot in the back and ran from the room towards the motel lobby. In the lobby, Selena told employees that she had been shot uh, by Yolanda, then she passed out. 911 was called, but when they arrived, Selena had lost so much blood that her veins had collapsed and it was impossible to get an IV started. Selena was taken to Corpus Christi Memorial Hospital, where she was pronounced dead at 1.05 p.m. Cause of death was blood loss and cardiac arrest. Selena Quintanilla Perez was just 23 years old and just two days away from her third wedding anniversary. Oh. And 16 days away from her birthday. Of course. Selena was described as an amazing soul and spirit who was funny, generous, kind-hearted, and hardworking. She was naturally talented with a gift for making fans feel like she was addressing them each personally. She was lively, outgoing, gracious, and magic on stage. In the book Como La Flor, author Joe Patolsky said that Selena, quote, was just wonderful to everybody, whether it was the assistant at at a shoot or the president of Coca-Cola. She knew who everybody was, hugged them, and made it seem like it was a privilege for her to be doing what she was doing. Oh, what a loss. What a senseless tragedy. I mean, listen, I've written so many angry notes it's just again season four more 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 anger um on that note we're gonna take a quick break grab another drink hit the can and we're gonna be right back with more about selena on this episode of true creme and cocktails okay and there's that all right here we go clap to electric boogaloo one two three Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the very, very tragic death of Selena. Before the break, Christy was reminding me of how much this woman accomplished in her very, very, very short life. Yeah. And now I think we're going to get into the hard-hitting portion of the episode. Take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, You're welcome. I know what a lot of people are thinking right now. I told them all about the crime before we even got to the first break. So they're like, Christy, what could possibly be left to talk about? And to that, I say so much. Yeah. Listen, we, so, you've never led us astray before. Yeah. You wouldn't start now. No, not, not in season four. More, oh, more, 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 more. more. <laughs> so. We are going to get into this in a more detailed fashion. First, we're going to talk about the weeks leading up to the murder. And I know that Yolanda calls it an accident, but I refuse to call it that because I don't believe it was for a second. Yep. So as you may recall, previously on this episode, (laughs) I mentioned March 9th, 1995, 
Abraham and his daughters confronted Yolanda about her allegedly embezzling from their company. Abraham threatened to get the police involved. The very next day, Yolanda went to a gun shop in San Antonio called A Place to Shoot, where she told the clerks she needed to buy a gun for protection because her job as an in-home nurse was dangerous because a patient's family had threatened her. Here we go. Which I know was a pile of lies because she hasn't been a nurse for years at this point. She ended up buying the Taurus Model 85 snub-nosed 38 caliber revolver and some hollow point bullets. Now, I don't know why Yolanda chose that particular ammunition, but hollow point bullets are designed to cause more extensive injuries than regular bullets. So it feels like a very specific choice to me. Interesting. On March, on March 13th, Yolanda went to her lawyer's office and wrote a resignation letter, then drove to Corpus Christi and checked into the Sand and Sea Motel. Selena was in Miami at the time, but was heading back to Texas the next day, March 14th. So Yolanda calls Selena, schedules a meeting in a parking lot 25 miles or 40 kilometers away. When Selena arrived, Yolanda showed her the gun. Selena told her to get rid of it and not to worry. She would protect Yolanda from her father because that was the whole thing she thought that Yolanda was concerned about Abraham. So March 15th, Yolanda returned to a place to shoot and returned the gun, saying her father had given her a 22 caliber pistol instead. Again, lies. But I'm fascinated by the fact that she returned the gun the day after speaking with Selena. Abraham believes that this meeting was Yolanda's first attempt to take Selena's life. But because Selena was so lovely with her, because she always was, it was, okay, I may still have a hope of being in her life. I'll return the gun. She's right. So Yolanda then makes a trip to Mexico as she was supposed to oversee production of the clothing line. While there, Yolanda stole perfume samples and bank statements that belonged to Selena. Because apparently Yolanda feels like she had not taken enough yet. On March 27th, Yolanda returned to a place to shoot and repurchased the revolver. She then contacted Selena and asked her to meet with her alone at a hotel. But when Selena arrived, the place swarmed with fans because they somehow found out she was going to be there and their meeting was cut short. Abraham is convinced that this was Yolanda's second attempt to take Selena's life. March 30th, Selena called Leonard Wong, who made the perfume samples for her and said she would try and get the samples back from Yolanda. According to Leonard, Selena said that she would be meeting with Yolanda the following day. Selena also told a boutique employee that she was going to fire Yolanda. March 31st, 1995, Selena agreed to meet with Yolanda at the Days Inn on Navigation Boulevard in Corpus Christi. Selena headed to the motel around 7.30 a.m. When she arrived, Selena asked for the financial documents that she needed to file taxes for the business. Yolanda responded by telling Selena she was attacked yesterday during her trip to Mexico. Yolanda said that she had been sexually assaulted by two men who then hit her repeatedly with a baseball bat and left her alone on a road in the middle of nowhere. Selena immediately took Yolanda to Doctors Regional Hospital, where Yolanda told medical staff she'd only had a little bit of bleeding, despite the fact that on the way to the hospital, she told Selena she was bleeding profusely. Now, let me say this. I have said it in the past, and I will scream it from the rooftops forever. I believe women. I believe victims. Yes. So this is a difficult thing where I want to believe Yolanda, but it feels like she's maybe using a fake attack to buy herself time before being inevitably fired. 
because she knows if she gives up the documents, Selena's done with her. She won't see her again. If she doesn't give up the documents, the longer she can push that, the longer that Selena will stay in her life. Multiple doctors later said that while Yolanda appeared to be tired, she didn't have any bruises or evidence that indicated she had been assaulted the day before. Another nurse claimed there were some red welts on Yolanda's arm and neck, but they didn't resemble the bruises that someone would get from an assault with a baseball bat. Yolanda's story about the attack also changed multiple times, depending on who she was talking to at the moment. Yolanda claims that on March 30th, around 1 or 1.30 p.m., she was attacked by two men on a road between Monterey and Matamoros. Matamoros. She said the men raped her, then hit her several times on the back and stomach with a baseball bat before stealing her car and leaving her on the side of the road. Now, this is horrific. But again, how could someone be hit repeatedly with a baseball bat and not have a single bruise to show for it? And the men stole her car, but not her money or her wallet. So somehow Yolanda managed to get a ride from the middle of nowhere to a town where she could rent a car and drive home to San Antonio, which is about 295 miles or 475 kilometers away. According to Google, that trip would take a, just over five hours, like five hours, 15 minutes, like ish. Then. When in San Antonio, she borrowed her nephew's truck and drove to Corpus Christi, which is another 143 miles or 231 kilometers away, or roughly a two-hour drive. According to the staff at the Days Inn, Yolanda checked in between 7.30 and 8.30 p.m. So if this attack happened at around 1 p.m., that means... Yolanda had six to seven hours to get a ride from the middle of nowhere to the nearest town, drive more than five hours to San Antonio, go home, change, get her nephew's truck, drive another two hours. The timing of it just does not fit for me. And they stole her car, but not her money because she still had her money to be able to rent a car to get home. Right. And, and ID how, and everything, you, you yep. have to show that. Yeah. And how long was she waiting in the middle of nowhere for a car to come by that would actually take her? Also, the outfit that Yolanda was wearing during the alleged assault was entered into evidence at the trial. The prosecution said the clothes looked as though someone had cut holes and shredded the clothing with a pair of scissors to make it look like there had been an attack. Not to mention, if the clothing had been cut like that while Yolanda was wearing them, she would have had cuts all over her body, but there were none. But more on the trial in a moment. So after uh, Yolanda was examined by uh, a doctor and multiple nurses, Selena took Yolanda back to the motel. That morning, Selena was supposed to be at a session at the Q production studio and when she didn't show up by 10 a.m., Abraham called Chris and Chris called Selena. She told Chris that she had forgotten about the session, but she would be there shortly after she was done, quote, taking care of one last item of business. When they returned to the motel, Yolanda and Selena started arguing. Multiple witnesses claimed that they overheard, overheard two women arguing about business matters Selena allegedly told Yolanda she could no longer trust her, and so she demanded the financial documents. When Yolanda didn't comply, Selena emptied Yolanda's, Yolanda's bag, which had bank statements, and a gun. Yolanda grabbed the gun, and when Selena turned to leave, the gun went off. According to Yolanda, it was an accident, but to me, and I'm just speculating here, to me it feels like the trigger was intentionally pulled. Yeah. The shot was fired at 11.48 a.m. Selena ran from the room and ran approximately 390 feet or 119 meters to the motel lobby, leaving a blood trail as she went. 
She collapsed on the lobby floor at 11.49 a.m. She told motel employees that she had been shot, and she said, Yolanda, room 158, and lost consciousness. Barbara Schultz, the motel manager, called 911 and said, quote, we have a woman, ran in the lobby, she's been shot, she's laying on the floor, and there's blood. An ambulance was on scene in less than two minutes. First responders attempted to put in the IV, but were unable to do so as Selena's veins had collapsed from the incredible loss of blood. They remained on scene for five minutes before arriving at Corpus Christi Memorial Hospital at 12 p.m. When they arrived, Selena had no vital signs, but they managed to establish an erratic heart heartbeat, so she was taken to a trauma room. The bullet had shattered her collarbone and damaged her right lung. Medical staff tried a blood transfusion, but the damage was too great. And at 1.05 p.m., Selena was pronounced dead. Due to the high profile nature of the case, an autopsy was performed, which revealed the bullet entered Selena's upper right back near her shoulder blade, passed through her chest cavity, severed the right subclavian artery, and exited her right upper chest. In just mere minutes, Selena lost, quote, virtually all of the blood in her body. Oh, my God. It was noted that if the bullet had been just one millimeter higher or lower, Selena may have survived. Wow. The following day, there was a public viewing of Selena's casket. A lineup of fans nearly a mile long waited for their chance to get inside. When a rumor started going around that the casket was empty, the Kinton... Quintanillas agreed to have an open casket viewing. 30 to 40,000 fans viewed the casket and more than 78,000 signed a book of condolence. On April 3rd, 1995, 600 guests attended the burial at Seaside Memorial Park. Fans were devastated over the loss of Selena, but some people, specifically shock jock Howard Stern, was a real dick about it. And if we know anything about Howard Stern, it's that him being a dick about something isn't that much of a surprise. Stern mocked Selena's death on the air, criticized her fans and her music. He said, and this is a Howard Stern quote, this music does absolutely nothing for me. Alvin and the Chipmunks have more soul. Spanish people have the worst taste in music. They have no depth. Oh, my God. Yeah. And just when you think that Howard Stern couldn't get any worse, he then proceeded to play Selena songs with gunshot noises in the background. Howard Stern is a truly disgusting individual. And honestly, I'm not surprised. List of just some appalling things that Howard Stern has done. Side note. <laughs> He's used racial slurs. He fat shamed Carney Wilson of Wilson Phillips fame. He fat shamed Lena Dunham and called her talentless. He made derogatory statements about David Letterman's wife. He was horrific to our girls, Britney Spears and Anna Nicole Smith. Mm -hmm. He did a sketch in 1993 in full blackface. He was shitty to Robin Williams. He called Wendy Williams a jealous bitch on the air. Two of his books make horrific statements about gay men. Mm. Horrific enough that I'm not saying that I will not repeat them here. Yeah. And he made Gilda, Gilda Radner cry during an interview in 1983. Not yep. Gilda. Correct. Gilda didn't, didn't do nothing to nobody. Nope. That's... That was the straw. I think, I mean, I mean, so many. Of it's these all things. awful. I, yeah. I can't even Gilda begin. So, so innocent. Yeah. Like, I can't even begin to get into the things he did to Anna Nicole. Uh, oh, I just, the shit with Anna Nicole is bad. Yeah, it's just, honestly, if I had more time, I easily could have doubled that list. Oh yeah. But Stern's listeners were outraged over his disrespect towards Selena and an arrest warrant was issued for Stern for disorderly conduct. Whoa! He eventually made an on-air statement in Spanish 
saying his comments were not made to, quote, cause more anguish to her family, friends, and those who loved her. Then what were the point of your statement, dickhead? Uh, Texas retailers removed any products relating to Howard Stern and his show, and even two of his biggest sponsors, McDonald's and Sears, sent Stern letters expressing their disapproval over his actions. I'll say it. I've never understood his popularity. I, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, too, where, where you know, it just feels like sometimes. Because there's always the argument about, well, in comedy, you should be able to make fun of everything and whatever. And it's like, I don't necessarily disagree. But what I disagree with is, is that it's like, but you have to have a point of view that's relevant and smart. And sure. When you're just doing things to be shocking, which. Oh, then it's like. If there, if you can't back it up, then, then I don't think it's relevant, you know? Oh yeah. The fact that all he wanted was attention, whether it was positive or negative, it's, it's just gross, but enough about him back to our main story, because I know you're all wondering what happened with Yolanda Saldivar. Yes. Well, after Selena ran for the motel lobby. Yolanda left room 158 and went straight to her pickup truck in, or I guess it was her nephew's pickup truck in the parking lot. An officer who happened to be on the scene approached Yolanda's vehicle, asked her if she was involved in the shooting. She said no. She tried to back the vehicle up, but got blocked in. As police started to approach the truck, Yolanda grabbed the revolver, raised it to her right temple and said, quote, don't come close or I'll shoot. The scene went on for hours. They siphoned the gas from the gas tank. They turned on floodlights. A SWAT team came in. FBI negotiators were brought in to talk with her. She was beside herself. She said things like, I don't want to live, and I hurt my best friend. One officer suggested to Yolanda, maybe the whole thing was just an accident. And Yolanda immediately said, well, I didn't mean to do it before proceeding to blame Abraham for trying to separate her from Selena. Police even lied to Yolanda, saying that Selena might survive, even though she had been declared dead hours prior. Six hours in, Yolanda agreed to surrender. But when she got out of the truck, she saw police officers holding rifles she ran back to the truck screaming, they're going to kill me. After more than nine hours, Yolanda oh. finally agreed to surrender at 9.30 p.m. The whole thing was very reminiscent of the police standoff with O.J. Simpson after the Bronco chase in June 1994, just nine months prior. For more information on that case, check out episode 71, Nicole Brown Simpson. Yes. According to the police present during the standoff, Yolanda threatened to take her own life 270 times. Wow. Yolanda was immediately taken into custody and interrogated. She told police that, Abra that Abraham um, believed that Yolanda was distracting Selena from her music, and he was trying to push her out. She said that the meeting at the hotel got heated, and she didn't intend to shoot Selena, but rather had planned to take her own life instead. Yolanda said the gun accidentally went off. And if that's true, then why didn't Yolanda immediately drop the gun? Or why didn't she run to Selena's aid? Since, you know, she had training as a nurse. Or why didn't, why didn't she use the motel room phone or either of her two cell phones to call 911? Instead, she made a run for her vehicle, and that does not feel like the move of an innocent person to me. Nope. During the interrogation, Yolanda said things like, I can't believe I killed my best friend. Uh, she also told police that she and Selena, quote, both argued because I wanted to quit working for her. I gave her everything I had, the cellular phone and bank files, as we argued. There is no planet on which Yolanda was going to quit working for Selena. 
she was not going to be the one who said, I quit, I'm out. Trying to write the narrative that they were arguing because Yolanda wanted to quit as opposed to the fact that she was being fired is ridiculous. Yolanda said that Selena opened the door to leave and Yolanda told her to close it. She claimed the gun accidentally went off when Selena left. On the day of Selena's burial, Yolanda was arraigned where she pleaded not guilty and bail was initially set at $100,000. It was raised to $500,000 after the district attorney called Yolanda a flight risk. And it turns out that maybe jail was the safest place for her. A dominant Texas gang known as the Mexican Mafia allegedly started taking up a collection in the hopes of posting Yolanda's bail so that they could be the ones to kill her. And then when word got out that Doug Tinker was going to be Yolanda's defense attorney, Tinker received a postcard, allegedly from the Mexican Mafia, threatening his life for simply defending Yolanda. At a pretrial hearing, the defense attorney filed a motion for change of venue as he believed Selena was so beloved, there was no chance that Yolanda would get a fair trial in Corpus Christi. Judge Mike Western, Westergren agreed the trial was moved to Harris County Courthouse in Houston. The defense attorney also filed a motion to exclude Yolanda's oral statements made at the time of her arrest, as well as her written statement. Both motions were denied. But I get why he tried. When Yolanda signed her official statement, it was after an alleged 11-hour interrogation, which was after the nine and a half hour standoff. So she probably was not in her right mind, uh, whatever her statement uh, was. Right. Uh, Judge Westergren ordered that the trial would not be televised or filmed in any way. And he also limited the number of reporters who would be allowed in the courtroom as he wanted to avoid a repeat of the Simpson circus. The trial began October 11th, 1995. Lead prosecutor Carlos Valdez came in hot in his opening statement by declaring that Yolanda, quote, deliberately killed Selena. Valdez believed, quote, Yolanda wanted to kill Selena because Selena was firing Yolanda. She wouldn't exist if she didn't have Selena. And if she didn't work for Selena, she didn't work, want to work for anybody. Defense attorney Doug Tinker used his opening statement to plant the seed that Yolanda was innocent and that the true villain in all of this was Abraham, who Tinker said was a controlling and dominating father, ambitious for money and power. He claimed that Abraham had driven Yolanda to near madness by threatening to destroy her friendship with Selena. The prosecution called between 45 and 50 witnesses including Abraham, Chris, and employees from the Selena Boutique and the Days Inn. Trinidad Espinoza was a custodian at the Days Inn. He testified that he saw Yolanda follow Selena out of the room after she'd been shot. And while Selena ran towards the lobby, Yolanda raised the gun to take another shot. But Selena ran around the corner before she was able to. He Whoa. said Yolanda, he said Yolanda lowered the gun and walked back to the room emotionless. The testimony of Norma Martinez, a maid at the Days Inn, was similar to Trinidad's as she testified that she saw Yolanda follow Selena out of the room and point the gun at her. But Norma claims while pointing the gun, Yolanda called Selena a bitch. The defense brought the Days Inn manager to the stand who claimed that it was impossible for either Trinidad or Norma to have seen anything because their work was on the other side of the building. Well, she didn't know what they were each working on at that exact time. So who knows? Yeah. But either way, uh, defense argued that Trinidad and Norma were just looking for their 15 minutes of fame, which just makes me think of that scene in Liar Liar. Uh, when Jim Carrey objects to something and the judge asks why, and he says, because it's devastating to my case. <laughs> yeah. That movie uh, stays with me for life. The idea that your choice of romantic partners, you, you either have to pick 
Jim Carrey or Carrie Elwes. Oh no, <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> come on, Blanche, ladies and gentlemen and people. <laughs> she had to come out at some point, didn't she? She did. Uh, the defense agreed that Yolanda did run after Selena, but said that she did so to help Selena get to the truck so that Yolanda could take her to the hospital. Oh, come on. And yet, according to those witnesses, Yolanda didn't run after Selena to try and help her in any way, but rather to try and potentially take another shot. She also didn't, like, call out for her or chase her down or anything. And why would you think, get her to a hospital? Check her out. You're a nurse. Uh, The prosecution also brought in firearms experts who stated that the gun was in very good working condition and that, quote, a person pulling the trigger must use a great amount of pressure. They also testified that it was impossible for Yolanda to not know that Selena had been wounded, which means Yolanda specifically chose not to go to Selena's aid. The defense team called fewer witnesses who included Yolanda's parents, Days in employees, and Selena's former seventh grade teacher. Why? Because their whole plan was to push the idea that Abraham was a tyrant who made Yolanda's life hell. And I get it. Taking a child out of school and forcing her to be the family's main source of income isn't the best parenting. But regardless as to what Abraham did, it didn't warrant Yolanda buying a gun. Nope. According to Yolanda, she first claimed she bought the gun because Abraham had threatened to kill her. Yolanda also claimed that Abraham slashed her car tires. And I'm sorry, but this is very graphic. So fair warning. Okay. Yolanda claimed that Abraham sexually abused her by sticking a knife in her vagina. And then threatening to kill her if she went to the police. None of Yolanda's allegations have ever been proven, even after a medical exam. Okay. When asked in court why she bought the gun, Yolanda said, quote, I bought this gun to kill myself, not her. And she told me, Yolanda, I don't want you to kill yourself. And we were talking about that when I took it out and pointed it to my head. And when I pointed it to my head, she opened the door. I said, Selena, close the door. And when I did that, the gun went off. So it was in your hand when it went off? Yep. Okay. So let's say the gun did just randomly go off on its own, even though the firearms experts said that wasn't likely. Mm -hmm. What are the odds that the gun would go off once in the span of a couple of minutes while Yolanda was holding it in the hotel room? And yet... It didn't go off accidentally one more time in the nine and a half hours she was sitting with it in the car. In their closing arguments, the defense team claimed that the entire thing was an accident and that Yolanda hadn't pulled the trigger. But to that, I say, if that's true, why didn't Yolanda immediately drop the gun when it fired and then frantically run after Selena to help her? Selena was covered in blood. She left a trail as she ran. It was very obvious she was wounded, but Yolanda did nothing. She didn't call 911. She didn't use her medical training. She was likely the only person in the immediate area who had that level of medical training. And she did nothing to try and stop the bleeding. Didn't even try and get close to her. The jury deliberated for two hours and 23 minutes. Yolanda Saldivar was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole for 30 years. More than 200 accredited media were on the scene to hear the verdict. The traffic in Houston was at a standstill because people got out of their cars and just ran to celebrate the verdict. There were tears of relief and tears for Selena and also a mass of fans who were chanting, hang the witch. Wow. Yeah. The Mexican mafia, who were fairly dominant in the Texas prison system, allegedly put a price on Yolanda's head, adding that whoever killed her would be a hero. Because of this, 
Yolanda was placed in isolation, spending 23 hours a day alone in her cell. Yolanda will be eligible for parole in March 2025 when she is 65 years old. Regardless, I hope she doesn't get out. Yolanda has since tried to appeal in October 1998 and again in August 1999 because she believed that evidence had gone missing and that some witnesses weren't called. Both appeals were denied. But despite all of Yolanda's lies, she was right about one thing. Evidence did go missing, although I think she was referring to something else entirely. But long after the trial was over, someone noticed that the gun used to kill Selena had gone missing. It was located nearly seven years later in May 2002 in the home of the court reporter from the trial. They claimed the weapon was accidentally placed in a box of office supplies. Stop it. Many people believe the weapon should have been placed in a museum, but a judge ordered that the gun should be destroyed. Yes. He believed it would help bring Selena's family some closure. Absolutely. According to the Caller Times newspaper, the gun was cut into 50 pieces, which were then just tossed into the Corpus Christi Bay. That's not destroying it. And to that I say, isn't there a better system than purposely throwing garbage into a body of water? <laughs> Maybe I don't, I don't know, melt it down or something. I just, I get they wanted it out of the hands of people uh, who tried to want to, who would want to take it as a piece of like a souvenir. But how much are they randomly throwing into that bay? I Googled and it seems like that's like the one time they did it, but it's but it's it also just like, but then you're just, you're just enticing people to go on a treasure hunt. That's a great point. Uh Oh, we cut up the gun into all these pieces. You've got that many chances to win. Go find it. Like that's a terrible idea. Great point. Uh, so I've talked a lot about Yolanda and I uh, would like to go back to speaking about Selena. Yes. Within hours of her death, record stores sold out of all of her albums. EMI Latin pressed several million more just to meet demands. Selena became a household name in the United States and a part of American pop culture. The April 1st, 1995 edition of the Corpus Christi newspaper Caller Times sold out. They released an additional 11,000 copies which also sold out, so they added another 20,000 copies. The McAllen newspaper, The Monitor, sold out two issues in the days following Selena's death. And from what I understand, newspapers selling out is like a once in every two to three decades kind of a situation. People Magazine released a commemorative issue just days later, thinking that the public's interest would wane over time. But both its first and second runs sold out within two weeks, and the issue sold nearly one million copies. Whoa. The issue became a collector's item, which was a first for People magazine. Due to the immense sales, it led to the creation of People on... Um, people on... Uh, oh. <laughs> I'd made it so far. You're doing great. Uh People on Espanol, as well as Newsweek on Espanol and Latina magazine. Wow. Dreaming of You, the English crossover album that Selena was working on at the time of her death, was released in July 1995. It hit number one on the Billboard Top 200 on August 5th, 1995, making it the first album by a Latin artist to debut at number one. It breaks my heart to think that Selena never got to see that. On the day of its release, the album sold 175,000 copies, which was a record at the time for a female vocalist. In the first week, it sold 331,000 copies, which made Selena the third female singer to sell more than 300,000 copies in a week. The first two being Janet Jackson and Mariah Carey. Wow. 
Nielsen side note. Nielsen Music started tracking point of sales data for U.S. music releases in 1991. As of October 2021, only 21 albums have sold at least 1 million in one week. I don't have time to list them all. But the oldest entry on the list is the soundtrack for The Bodyguard in 1993. The most recent addition is Taylor Swift's Reputation in 2017. Okay. Some artists made it on the list twice, including Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, and Eminem. Taylor Swift appears on the list a very impressive four times. Wow. To me, most of the artists on the list make sense. Britney Spears, Lady Gaga, The Beatles, Adele. Then there's a few surprises like Lil Wayne, 50 Cent, and Limp Biscuit, who made it to the list with their 2000 release, Chocolate Starfish and the Hot Dog Flavored Water. And yes, one of those 1 million people who purchased that album was me. (laughs) (laughs) So just know that. Uh, Since her death, six Selena albums have been released. They all reached number one on the Billboard Latin Albums chart. To date, Selena has sold more than 18 million albums worldwide. Just two weeks after her death, then-Governor George W. Bush Mm. declared Selena's birthday, April 16th, to be Selena Day in Texas. Unfortunately, some people got pissy about that because in 1995, April 16th happened to be on Easter Sunday. And you can't please everybody. So yeah, don't try. Just, just don't try. <laughs> that, was, that, that got dark real fast. Mm. Uh, the Quintanilla family opened a Selena museum in Corpus Christi, which they still operate to this day. It contains photos, memorabilia, and even some of Selena's most iconic outfits. For those in the Corpus Christi area, the museum is on Leopard Street at the same location as Q Productions. And speaking of the Corpus Christi area, downtown on North Shoreline Boulevard, you will find a statue of Selena, which has been there since 1997. In 2020, some dickhead posed next to the statue after putting a MAGA hat on the statue's head. The man, who I refuse to name because I think he's had enough attention already, uh, said he did it to, quote, express Latino support for Donald Trump. And to that man, I say, ya boy. Boying. In 1997, a biographical movie was released about Selena's life called Selena. It starred Edward James Almos and a then unknown Jennifer Lopez. Selena fans were initially upset at the casting as JLo's heritage is Puerto Rican, not Mexican. But once the film was released, fans could not have been happier with JLo's performance. And honestly, I know that I never met Selena personally, but I feel like JLo beautifully captured her spirit and the movie proved to be JLo's breakout role. I did cry twice. Oh. And then pointed out all the inaccuracies. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Who I'm sure was having a great time anyway. You contain multitudes. <laughs> Bless you. Selena movie true crime side note. Whoa. One of the actresses who auditioned for the role of Selena was Gloria De La Cruz, who was using the stage name Letitia Miller. She looked so much like Selena that she was often called Selena's double. To the point where I have Googled to find a photo of this woman. And they're all photos of Selena. Like, I genuinely cannot find one that I know for sure is her because everyone, there's one photo that people are like, well, this is Gloria. And I was like, I don't think, so. I think that's Selena. Like, it's Oh, that's it's funny. Uh, on April 21st, or 21st, what's happening? 21st, Colin Firth. I, I was just going to say April 20, Colin Firth. I've lost my mind. This is, this is not well, because this is, we're you thought we were out of the darkness we're back in the darkness for a brief moment yep i am losing my mind all the time 
On April 21st, 1996, Gloria was last seen with friends at a party in Oxnard, California, which is just west of Los Angeles. The next day, Gloria's body was found in a dumpster in the Wilshire District in LA. It is believed that she was raped, strangled, put into the trunk of a car, driven to LA, where her body was put into a dumpster and set on fire. The fire damage was so bad, it took 17 days for Gloria to be properly identified. Oh my God. And the worst part, I have not said, she was just 18 oh. at the time of her death. In January 1997, 28-year-old Corey Robinson was arrested for the crime, and while he denied any involvement, his DNA matched the semen and blood found on the body. Robinson also had a history of violence. At 17, he was placed in a county-run boys' home for raping and choking his stepmother. Then he spent five years in a California youth facility for abusing his girlfriend while she was holding their infant child. Robinson was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is all something that I didn't expect to find while researching a movie starring yeah. Jennifer Lopez. Wow. Who I love. And I think I've mentioned that several times. Christy, calm down. Yep. If I could just get an invite to your wedding, I'll be very quiet. Of I will course. sit at the back, but I will cry. I we will cry. Will. We all will. Do you think she's even going to wear, like, I think she's going to wear like an, like she's going to wear a dusty pink. Oh, you she's going to wear green. Green's her color. And he got her a, he a got that the, ring, the mm. green ring. <gasps> I bet you she's going to wear Do you think that's it's going to be like a mint? Yeah. Pale green. Oh. That's my prediction. Oh, that's, I mean, I can say this without seeing her. She's going to look stunning. <laughs> It'll pop. It will. Pop. Oh, I can't wait for those photos. Please do mm -hmm. a people exclusive. So, so those photos are everywhere. I'll even take the ones that they take from the helicopters and stuff. Don't ruin her wedding with helicopters. <laughs> just, just let me be there. I won't even eat. I'll bring my own snacks. You don't have to pay for anything. <laughs> just the rustling of like, of the, of the bag as it's, and I'm just like, I know it's going to be me taking out a PB and J from a Ziploc. Be like, sorry, you'll make a face and it'll be because I'm making noise, but I'll look at you and be like, oh, sorry, you want half? And then I was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes, but quietly, come on. Just to have Ben Affleck glare at me once in my life, it might be worth it. I just hope they get there. I, 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 if he does, if he dicks her around again, listen, we can't go on this tangent, but I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll recover. I don't know if oh, I'll recover if it no, doesn't end up happening. I need That's this. I need them happy. I really need them happy. Yes. Oh, wow. We really took a turn. So even though Selena has been gone nearly 30 years, she has not been forgotten. Case in point, in October 2020, the University of Texas at San Antonio started to offer a course called Selena a Mexican-American identity and experience. According to the university, the course looks at Selena's life and career and, quote, maps out the historical trajectory of the Mexican-American identity and experience in Texas. Apparently, in the first year, 30 people took the course. Oh. And as far as I can tell, it is ongoing. Uh, also in 2020, Netflix released Selena the Series, starring Christian Serratos, as Selena. Some may know her uh, as Rosita from The Walking Dead, but to me, she will always be Angela from Twilight. Mm. Although I will say, in Selena the series, she transforms. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Mac Cosmetics and Forever 21 both released Selena inspired collections because if I've learned anything about Selena, it's that she had an undeniable star power and was a true fashion icon. Selena received a star on the Walk of Fame in November 2017. Uh, it is right in front of the Capitol Records building, which is ironic since they went with EMI Latin instead of Capitol. Right. Um, it's on Vine Street, and she was the 2,622nd star to be placed 
on the Walk of Fame. Mm. Does the order in which a star gets placed matter? No, but she's in good company because the star that got placed after her was Nick Nolte, followed by Dwayne Johnson, Gillian oh. Anderson, Mary J. Blige, and Minnie Mouse. Wow. I know, like that grouping. I was like, nice. Uh, to date, Selena has been nominated for 86 awards. Wow. And won 67 of them. She was also awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Grammys in 2021. At the Tejano Music Awards, she won Female Vocalist of the Year in 1986, 1987, and then every single year from 1989 to 1997. She won Female Entertainer of the Year every year from 1988 to 1997. Selena Quintanilla Perez was a businesswoman, a fashion designer, a singer, a performer, and an outright trailblazer. She was credited with catapulting the Tejano genre in the mainstream market. It's tragic that her life was cut so incredibly short, especially when she had just won a Grammy and was on her way to cross over into mainstream music. I find it heartbreaking that the most that most of the world didn't get to see her for the star that she was until after her death. And the fact that her life was taken by someone that she trusted completely enrages me. And honestly, I hope that Yolanda gets denied bail and rots in prison for the rest of her life because that's where I'm at. Reporting for True Crime and Cocktails I am not Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you did great. We can oh. all agree on that. Um, look, you've earned another drink, as as, <laughs> as have all of we. Grab another one, hit the cam one more time, and we're going to be right back to give our final thoughts on the Selena episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Okay, wrapping it up on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, talking about Selena. And, you know, I got to say, truthfully, I didn't know a lot of the intricate details of this case. I knew the the kind of like broad strokes coming sure. in. Sure. And it really, I got to tell you, the first act, if this is a three act show, <laughs> you the are first an actor. Act, it makes sense. The whole time, the whole time. The whole, the whole time. time? <laughs> One of my favorite Sally bits. Field. Sally Field. Um, but the whole time I was like, God, this is heartbreaking. And it really is, you know, when you start to really look at how much she had done, and I know I had mentioned this briefly earlier, but how much she had done in such a short time. Oh, yeah. It really is so heartbreaking. And it's always heartbreaking, but I think there is just something about seeing someone who's blazing the way. This is a, this is a woman who changed the game for other people to come. Yes. And that being snuffed out senselessly, so senselessly. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. Um, now you mentioned pizza hut. Now this is a little, just very quick side note, which I feel like uh, dear listeners, you'll appreciate. Uh, anytime I hear pizza hut, I think about my parents because in high school, my mother sure. took on a second job. Uh, uh, working at Pizza Hut. And that's where she met my stepdad. And he proposed on the Pizza Hut sign because that's where they had met. Uh, he proposed oh. on that sign in my hometown. So shout out to the Belleville Pizza Hut. What sure. brought Laurel and Nick together. There you hey. go. Mother and Laurel and Nick. Um, anyway, I do think that's very charming that they profess right? their feelings for each other in Pizza Hut. Oh, gosh, those breadsticks, mouth watering. Mm, <laughs> num num. Um, if any, any human was like, Hey, let's go to pizza hut and get some breadsticks. And I'm going to tell you, I love you. Like, oof, now you've just like, now I've just been basically brainwashed because I'm swept like, off, swept, off, swept your feet. off my feet. It's that easy. Yeah. Um, okay. For, I also just have to make a comment and I agree with you. And I think it's important to note nothing that her father did made Yolanda do what she did. No, there's she he did not buy her the gun. He did not put it in her hand. He did not 
force any of those actions. I did feel as I was listening again in, in act one, um, the control that he was having felt a little problematic, upsetting to me. And I think this is just an overarching patriarchy feeling for me right now, given what's sure, going on in, in, in the world and specifically in, in, in America, in the United States, uh, all of this with him trying to keep her away from Chris. And it sounds like she and Chris had a pretty decent relationship from, yeah. from what we know. So again, it's like, um, I'm glad that she didn't take no for an answer and that she went after what she wanted Yes, and, and still, you know, and then I am glad that Abraham smartened up and was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go away. I'm going to get my head straight. I'm going to come back and smarten up. Yeah. Because I just don't love the concept of, I know what's best for you and I'm not going to allow you to have it all because she did have it all. So, and she, and we all should, and that's, uh, yes, you know, that's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, I just wrote down, let her live. I liked when you said, let her live. And I agree. I feel like that's a, that's a a quote we should all be living by. Um, the Grammy, I mean, again, she did so much. The first, the first female Tejano artist with a Grammy. I mean, this is, it's, it's just amazing. Um, Mexican Madonna. I'd never heard that before. Amazing. Um, it's so look, I'm not saying it's like, how do you run a background check on people? (laughs) But also (laughs) we know how to run background checks on people. Um, but it is, it is tragic that Yolanda had this past and that it feels like that was maybe not communicated or discovered by Abraham and the team when he was kind of adding Yolanda onto the team. Um, not that there's, but, but I mean, again, fraud, I feel like embezzlement, those kinds of things that would maybe stop you from bringing somebody into your inner fold. Sure. Um, different time though, not the internet the same way we have it now. So I'm sure it's not going to enter your mind in the same way, uh, that it would for us, for example. Now we also have a true crime podcast, but uh, as I've said before, I encourage everyone run a background check, you know, sure. If you're not sure, just, you know, pay for some peace of mind. Um, then I wrote down and you're going to love this. So as we're going through and you're telling this story and we're starting to get into the unpaid bills, the fan club members who had paid, but they weren't getting anything back. The employees that have dropped from 38 to 14, basically Yolanda is running everything into the ground, her stealing the money, et cetera. I just wrote in all caps, don't fuck with a woman's money. And I have to say, and I'll say it as a woman who, you know, as a successful woman, there is nothing that infuriates me more than somebody coming and and taking advantage of someone who is self-made. And this is a great example. This is this is I know that her dad helped her, but also like couldn't have gotten anywhere if she wasn't the talent. This was all her. Right. This she was the talent. Yeah. Self-made, winning awards, having all these opportunities. Yep. It makes I have literally like, I have like rage goosebumps. Like it really honestly makes my blood boil. And in general coming from people's money, but there's just something about like a young person who is coming and and building themselves up, making something out of nothing essentially. And you come and you fuck with their money. Oh, I know. I, I can't. It just, it just enrages me. It's like, why do you think that you deserve more? Like, why do you think you deserve a piece of what she worked for? Why yeah. do you, like, I can't, I can't. And I have some theories about Yolanda, but ultimately it's just, again, it just makes me so angry. Okay. A few things about the the actual day of the death. Selena grabs the purse, turns it over, tax documents come out, the gun comes out. Yeah. If at that point, if at that point, Yolanda had said she dumped the gun from the bag and as the gun fell out of the bag, it went off. Maybe in the grand scheme of anything being possible, maybe I could say, well, let's get some forensics going. Let's get ballistics going, whatever. But it's the fact that the gun came out and then you picked it up. And then when her back was turned, it went off. Stop it. Yeah. You didn't have to pick the gun up. 
Yep. She was apparently your best friend. You loved her more than anything. All of the above. Why did you pick the gun up? And the fact that her back was turned is so oh, I can't dark. Yep. You waited for her to turn her back and then I'm speculating, but it feels like, do we believe that the gun went off or, you know, just for a second that that's when she took her opportunity. And that's again, like such a, a mark of a, a coward, you know, somebody waiting for you to turn yeah. your back and, it's just like literal, it's a literal definition of like stabbing her in the back, right? It's it's literally yeah. shooting her in the back. I mean, it's, and the, the other thing too, and I don't know if you know this or not, because this is very specific, but we know she bought the gun and the the really damaging bullets the first time and then she returned. Yes. yes. Did she? I don't know if she returned those bullets or not, but my question is, is part of the reason why Selena bled out so quickly because the, the bullets in that gun were those? Yes. Okay. She that's was the, shot I, with the hollow point. Yes. So that's the reason why it was. That's so the reason it did it so badly. Yes. So that's another thing too. If you are buying a gun, and I know we've talked about guns on this show recently, but but we're, we're putting that aside for a second. If you're buying a gun for protection. Sure. Why do you need those bullets? Why are you, why are, why is that the choice? I it's, have a lot of questions about those specific bullets. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, we know now that let's say for a second, Yolanda's story is true and that the gun accidentally went off in her hand and shot her back best friend in the back and that she essentially bled out in the time it took for her to get from the room to the, the lobby very yeah. quickly. Because yeah. again, as we know, and I'm, I, I don't know Selena's size, but I don't think she was a she was super fairly small. She was a fairly yes. small woman. Um, the only reason you're buying that kind of bullet is to kill someone, is to destroy someone. This isn't self-defense. This isn't sending a warning shot. This isn't you trying to protect your home. This is you being like, I want to kill something, period. Yep. And I don't buy the fact that she was like, oh, it was only for suicide, only for suicide. Um, I just don't buy it. And I'm not trying to negate, and, and, and I, I in no way am suggesting that suicide ideation and all of those things don't exist and aren't aren't prevalent. And, and she may have had those things and I am not trying to, to negate that for her, but we are also talking about someone who has a very long track record of fraud, embezzlement, mm. stealing, lying, all of these kinds of things. Um, again, this story about the assault, and I agree with you, I believe women, I believe victims, et cetera, but it does feel like the timing doesn't add up that timeline doesn't add up. It, 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 again, I feel like what we're dealing with, with Yolanda. And I, at this point, I still haven't fully come to what my psychologist had diagnosis would be, but it's like, we're dealing with someone here who is severely mentally unstable is what it yes. feels like to me. Yeah. And I think that that's a fair statement to say all of these examples, I think are fair examples that would all lead to regardless of the diagnosis, there is an instability there. And because of that, I don't know. I don't know what that I believe that she was solely trying to take her life in that hotel room. Why would she have shown her the gun prior? Why did she bring out the gun then? Why did she have the gun in her hand pointed in a way that it was pointed at Selena? And I'm going to be, this is going to sound crass and it's not meant to be crass. But if there is a moment where she has, the gun has gone off and she's accidentally shot herself, her best friend in the back. And she has been having those thoughts. Why didn't she take her life in that moment? She had over nine hours sitting in that vehicle. And when she went to get out of the vehicle, she saw police with guns and went back to the vehicle because she was scared they were going to kill her. So it just, I, it's not adding yeah. up. It's just not adding up. And again, this isn't about, you know, we wouldn't say it unless there was, it was relevant to the state of mind of the case and that there was facts pointing otherwise. And I think the point here is, you know, we're, we're getting stalker kind of vibes from her. We're getting, if I can't have you, no one can kind of vibes. We're getting, you know, that really desperation where it's like, oh shit, I've been made. I've been found out. I have stolen sure. a large amount of money from these people. And now the one person who's always defended me is, is coming at me and saying, I know you're doing this. And 
you know, she was backed into a corner. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, I just don't think, I, I, to me, it feels like there was a different intention there. And again, it just, because look, and I love this is where I'm going. I was like, okay, if this is her best friend, I'm like, so if it's you and me, and for some reason I have a gun in my purse and you have dumped out my purse in front of me. And for sure. some reason I have picked sure. up that gun and we're in a fight. We never fight, but for some reason we're in a fight. I've drawn on your elephant. Oh, you drew on my elephant like you do when I was a child, you monster. And, <laughs> and somehow the gun has accidentally gone off. So we're, yeah. we're following the story as she is saying it happened. Yes. It, the gun is out of my hand and I am like, I'm on the phone. I'm, I'm wailing. I'm screaming. I'm getting you help. Period. Period. Right? Period. Yeah. Period. Like there is no bone in my body that is worried about me. There is no bone in my body. That's like, I got to get away. I got to get into this truck and drive. No way. If you are my best friend and I legitimately, a gun went off and I accidentally shot you, no way. It doesn't enter your mind. You would go into that. No. And as someone who was a nurse, you would go into that survival mode of, holy shit, something terrible has happened. We need to get this person help. You're on the phone calling 911. You're trying yes. to get pressure onto those wounds, whatever. I'm not a nurse. I don't know. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. No. Because to me, if a gun goes off and you're not expecting it to, your reaction is going to be frightened and you're going to, you're going to let go of that gun. You're going to just like, you're going to drop it. And your instinct is going to be, oh my God, are you okay? Your instinct isn't going to be to potentially raise the gun a second time. Yeah. And then just walk to your vehicle and be like, oh, I, I I wasn't involved. I was trying to get her to this vehicle. It's like, but but you went the opposite way. And you I know that try to go after people could argue that it's like, it's hard to speculate because you're not in the position. And I get that. But what I can speculate sure. about is, is that I can be in the position of, of what it would feel like to have accidentally hurt my best friend that I can sure. absolutely speak to. And I sure. can do it. No problem. And I'll, I'll go to the, I'll go to the mattresses with anybody about it. Of course it, you, you, I, I just, no, I don't buy it. No. Then you weren't best friends then it's that, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it doesn't yeah. add up is the point is that it's like, I just don't think that a human who has accidentally shot their best friend is going to go, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to sneak. No, yeah, potentially gone after the person again, based on these, these witnesses accounts. Um, even if, and I, I, I mean, it sounds to me like if there's two people where there's smoke, there's fire, but even if they, that was again, fake, which I don't, uh, who knows, it just doesn't add up. No, it doesn't add up. And nope. why, if you were completely innocent, why would you then lie as you were fleeing the scene? I, I, again, you wouldn't flee the scene. Your brain just wouldn't go there. I just don't buy it. I just nope. don't. Um, yes. So I also love that this Texas gang was like out for blood. They were like, you took our Selena. You took our oh, star. Like she we was will. so huge in that so, area. Oh, that I'm it's sure. like. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, and when you wrote, you wrote the trial was moved to Houston, and I just wrote, "That's fair." <laughs> yes, I was oh, like, yeah. "It is fair. That is fair." Even still, just being in the same state is still tough. But I was like, "I get it." Um, I love that they didn't televise the trial, trying to avoid this the, another O.J. Simpson situation. I just think that that, I mean, it was so fresh at that point. I feel like right. Oh, yeah, because yeah, it, the the car chase was ninety June ninety four. Yeah. And this was all going down in uh, mid to late 95. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think that that was for the best. Um, trying to make this all about Abraham, like I've said, or I was alluding to before, and, and you did as well. It's like, does he sound like he was a perfect father? Absolutely not. Does he sound like maybe he was even kind of a dick? It sounds like that. Sure. Does that automatically mean that he drove Yolanda to go and buy a gun and then return the gun and then go buy the gun again and then show up and and shoot his daughter no and that's the other thing if you're so pissed at him why didn't she go for him first and that again there's this is where it all starts to just fall apart the fact that the firearms experts were saying that the gun required a lot of pressure to go off as someone who has shot a handgun for television like sure and i have not necessarily shot that exact gun so i'm not an expert but like it doesn't just 
it, it's not a tapper. You know what I mean? Like you've sure. got to really, you got to give it some, they're designed that way. Believe yeah. it or not. That they're makes designed sense. That you really got to squeeze it to make sure you're really giving it a good go. Yeah. Um, it just doesn't feel, it just doesn't feel possible to me. Again, maybe it is, but my whole point is, is that if it was true, it's just falling apart at every, every sure. kind of step. Um, the idea of her getting out in 2025 at 65. Oh, I know. I don't know about that. That feels, I feel like maybe, maybe not. I feel like maybe not. Um, thank you for reading the entire Limp Bizkit album title. Uh, thank you for reminding us of that. That was nice. Uh, I love- I'm going to do something. I'm going to do it right. Of course. I love that she sold so many cop- copies of People Magazine that they started People en Espanol. I think that's so- lovely wow just uh, fucking first try huh i, I live here i live i live <laughs> california you know yeah, i know i'm uh, i'm around it more um, yeah that makes sense i don't want to ask who the person was that put the maga hat on her was it ted cruz don't don't know it, it was uh it was a latin man okay but I don't know him to, I saw the photo and went, oh, okay. Stop it. I love that. I just assumed it was Ted Cruz. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is I'm, if, if it was, I may have just outright been like, oh, and you know who did it? It was that fucker Ted Cruz. Like I, you know, I feel like I would have probably named him for whatever reason. I love but. it. I love it. No, no. You answered my question. Um, this connection to the movie, to the Selena movie and this other actress. Oh, I know. And that's a distance. And I know that you you verbalized it, but like Oxford is is out of town and the Wilshire area, like that's a drive. That's a drive. So yeah. the fact that, that that body had been moved and why, oh, so, so tragic. 18, oh God, terrible. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to comment on very quickly was, you did speak very eloquently and, and in a great amount of detail to obviously the legacy that Selena left, but there was one thing that you did miss. Okay. And that was the costume worn by Amos, Amy Sosa in the season three Halloween episode of Superstore. Of course. Where everybody thinks she's Selena Gomez. <laughs> You're right. Not everybody, but somebody thought she was Selena Gomez. You're yes. right. You're right. And it was, it was not because if you look, it is one of the iconic. It is. Selena outfits. I believe it's what she wore either at the, I think it was the Houston Astrodome outfit. Yes, I think it was. I think so. I think it was. And fun fact, that was a request from Ms. America for herself. She's a hey. big Selena fan, uh, I believe, and wanted to uh, wear that costume. So there you go. But my gosh, what a, what a ride. Oh, just so tragic. It feels like so... And also because she, it feels like Selena was really trying, really believed in the good in people, really believed in the good in Yolanda, really thought that she could get through to her. Like, maybe if I just meet with her alone, we can work this out. I know. We can get to the bottom of this. Such a loss. Terrible loss. Yeah. And yeah. my apologies to you and America for not <laughs> mentioning Superstore. I'm totally the joke kidding. is it popped in my head. The other day where I was like, oh my God, Amy did wear that. And then it just like left my brain. Oh, uh, and that that was it. But uh, I was like, when you said I missed something, I was like, oh, sure. This is completely a normal reaction. Let's hear it. (laughs) (laughs) No, I was going to get everything. No, I'm sure there are things that are going to be missed, but that would have been a fun Side note, at least. I don't know that anyone else would be adding it to the list of the prolific uh, legacy that Selena left. It no, was only it, me going like, I've got something to add to the batter. That was all. I, oh, that I love all. it. And I, I wish, I wish that I had uh, remembered to put it in my notes. Uh, yeah. I also Googled um, mid show. What a, what a beautiful time it can be to live in uh yeah. selena was about five foot four so not not a tall woman yolanda you didn't ask but i was like for comparison's sake about five one really she's a little woman just well, tiny see, again and you know what i want to know 
angles. I want to know angles, how that gun, went, how, how that bullet went in or what was the angle that that bullet went in? What was the angle that that bullet came out? That's a great point. Because then explain to me if she's shorter. Oh, see now this is, this is again, this is the magic of this show. If she's shorter and yeah. Selena was shot through the collarbone. Yeah. That says to me that she's aiming up. Right. Sure. She's got it. She's got it angled up. And that proves to me the gun is not at your side and it accidentally sure. goes off. The gun is not at rest and accidentally goes off. You are angled up. That gun was pointed at her. Yeah. To be honest with you, now I'm going to wildly speculate because I'm four high noons in. Sure. She could have been aiming for her head. Oh, it's possible. If she got shot through the collarbone. Now, knowing that she's shorter, and I know that we don't know what footwear they were wearing. Maybe they were in heels. Maybe they weren't. And I know that that changes things too, but no, that's just cemented it for me that I feel like it's like, come on, come on now. Come on now. What I like is I can add something in real quick and it, uh, it works wonders for you in that moment. I was like, I'll look that up. She asked, I didn't have an answer. I'll Google it real quick. And then I'm like, it's not worth it to say that I'll, I'll, say it later but I was like no I said I don't know in this episode so I'm like I need to come back with now I know but you always know you always know and that's the magic that you bring to this show it's, it's, I don't know what it is at this point you call it magic and I just call it oh god the whole time <laughs> <laughs> Sally Field doing that in that bit going the yep. whole time is to me the same as get in the water it's it's a line from a movie that means nothing to the rest yep. of the movie yep but somehow the first time the very first time i saw it, it stuck up something like it struck a chord in me and i can't let it go and i just for some reason those two are favorite parts of mine in those movies, they give me such joy in those moments. But I mean, of course, Sally Field, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, boo, she's boring. And now I'm like, I get it. Oh, yeah. I get it. Nuance. You're born Robin Williams and you grow up to be Sally Field. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get it. Yep. If you if you live long enough, you become the villain. Yeah. Um. I'm kidding. Christy Oxborough, amazing research. This was fabulous. I'm so happy to be back in the saddle with you. It's been, uh, it's just, it's tough. It's weird to be like, I should be recording tonight, but I'm not. And then again, we didn't think anything about, cause we we're still in constant communication. So we don't think anything about it. And then the zoom pops up and we chat for like an hour and a half. Before we even get into it, got a bit of a late start. Bit of a late yeah. start. Yeah, still going. Yeah. Still going. Still going. Yeah. Still going. Uh, but we thank you. I thank you. And on behalf of all the listeners, I'm going to be so bold as thank you for them too. Thank you for your research now, hey. season one, season two, season three, and even now, season four. More, more, more. Um, uh, we're very lucky to have you. So thank you. <laughs> uh, I think in the end, I think I'm the lucky one. Hey, maybe <laughs> when there was one set of footprints, <laughs> that's when I carried you. I'm not saying I'm Jesus. That's, I just realized that made me sound like I was comparing myself to Jesus. I'm not, I'm not. That's a <laughs> um, anyway, um, listen, thank you, dear <laughs> listeners for coming with us on this journey. We're so glad that you're here. If you haven't already, give us a follow on the social medias on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, Twitter at Not Detectives. Uh, and also, if you'd like a little bit more, some more of these chuckleheads, some more true crime, all of the above, go over to Patreon, patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails. We have bonus episodes over there for a month to our top tier uh, subscribers. We've got a monthly live Q&A. 
you can vote in a patrons poll for one of the episodes we do every month here on the show and so much more. I mean, it's a, it's a romp over there, like the Glee curse, an award-winning episode of this show. So check it out if you're interested. And the only place for official true crime and cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com. So check that out. If you haven't, uh, there's so much on there. It's a whole lot of fun. Uh, you'll enjoy it. It'll take a little uh, scroll through Christy. Do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? Oh, on the next True Crime and Cocktails, Lorena Bobbitt. Starting season four hot. Season four, yeah. more, more, more. Here we go. Um, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Robin Williams. I was going to pick Robin Williams. Were you? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Should we redo this and I'll pick Sally Field? Nah, I think we leave it as is.